I will be introducing our next speaker today, who is Dr. Felix Casanova from CIC Nanobune in San Sebastian, that is in the Basque country, North Spain. And this talk is going to be spend injection transport and manipulation. But let me tell you before that Dr. Casanova is an Iker Basque research professor and um, he's the co-leader of the nano devices group at Nanogune. His current research interests are focused on spin dependent phenomena, including spin transport and spin over defects in metals, insulators, and novel two-dimensional materials. He is responsible for the research effort in advanced nanofabrication and the group. Dr. Casanova has been an invited speaker in many of the most important international conferences in the field, and now here today, and he is the principal investigator of some European projects, like um, the ITN, SPEAR, Spin Orbit Materials, Imagine Phenomena, and Related Technologies Training. And he has been distinguished with the 2020 Outstanding Research Research Award by Intel Corporation. Hi, Felix. Hello, can you hear me? Very well. Then now I leave you to your talk. Thank you, Monse, for the nice introduction. And thank you, the organizers, especially Fernando, for, uh, for putting up together this nice school. Uh, also, thank you to the previous speakers. Uh, they get a very nice introduction, and I will kind of follow up from their uh, from their uh, basics that they started. Okay, so th this talk, uh, this this lecture would be on spin currents, on pure spin currents in particular, and we'll see <clears throat> that we need uh, different ingredients. And one ingredient is to generate these spins, and we will in particular focus with spin injection concept. We will also see once you can inject the spin current, then the spin current will be transported. Okay, so we will see a bit about spin transport. And finally, uh, how we can manipulate these spin currents. And putting it up together, we you know we might see what, what the future can lead us with uh, in regarding technology. Okay, so this is the long outline of my talk. Uh, don't get scared. Uh, some of them are only one slide each. So essentially, after a general introduction, many of the concepts have already been said, so I may, might skip some of them. I will go to three these three different ingredients. Uh, I will focus on how we can inject spins into a non-magnetic material, how these spins are transported, and how they are manipulated by, by different means. So let's start from the very beginning. Again, an electron has different degrees of freedom, the charge and the spin. I guess at this point we all know. But just uh, for you to, to understand the idea of spintronics, from the manipulation of the charge, the development of uh, electronics has arise, right? And it's been very successful. It's basically doing logic operations here, uh, leading to the down to the smartphones that we have now that are, are really very powerful computers in our pocket. On the other hand, the spin of the electron is what makes materials uh, magnetic and uh, magnetism has been used for uh, storage, uh, for memory, uh, very successfully as well as we've seen already in the previous talks, for instance, in hard drives. Um, but these somehow have taken different paths and, 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 the, and the idea of spintronics is that to, to use the information of the spin of the electron, so somehow to take this information uh, in one of these magnetic bits where the information is stored and move it somewhere else with uh, an electrical current so that the electrons forming the current carry this spin away so we can you know, put it somewhere else and do some kind of uh, logic operation, some manipulation, etc. Okay, so the merging of the two, uh, the two degrees of freedom, that's what would be spin electronics or spintronics. However, the idea is very nice, but it's not that easy. It's kind of a paradox because while the spin is the best non-volatile information storage, uh, when, when it's stored in, in, in a magnetic bit, in a magnetic material, once you try to take it away with a, with a charge current, it's 
highly volatile. The spin on formation is, is lost very fast. Okay. So one of the of the of the goals of spintronics and one of the ideas is to improve this transport uh, of, of, of the spin information and manipulate it. Uh, here I'm linking it to the previous talk of, of Jose Mari. Um, probably the most basic uh, spintronic device is, is a spin valve, as, as, as we saw. Basically, it's like two ferromagnetic materials sandwiched by a spacer. And just by just passing current, depending on the different orientation, you have a high resistance or a low resistance state, right? That we've seen this. Uh, uh, in, 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 in the previous talk. And, and the concept is, ve is very simple. Basically, you are transforming a magnetic information, parallel or anti-parallel in this case, to a electrical information, to a voltage, to resistance. Then the exact terminology will depend on the, on the spacer, right? We've seen GMR and TMR. There's also all these uh, uh, jungle, uh, domain wall monitor resistance and others, but the, the simplest uh, device would be something like this, this tri-layered simple configuration. Okay, this is, is a, ve a, a vertical structure with just two terminals, right? But very, very simple. Of course, then we've seen the technology and the improvement and optimization can be uh, very complicated, but the, the concept is very simple. And out of this very simple concept, we've seen how much the technology has evolved. Okay, in the case of, uh, of GMR, in only nine years, it went from, from the discovery to the, to the market as, as magnetoresistive read heads. And it, it, it was very important, for instance, in order to, to keep on increasing the aerial density of hard drives. So you see here the change of a slope around the year where the new uh, GMR device uh, was introduced. Because one of the limitations at the time was not the, to make the magnetic bit smaller, it was how to read a small magnetic bit. And with, a GM, uh, with the GMR sensors, the sensitivity was much higher and that was, was allowed, right? Uh, then uh, regarding TMR, one of the main applications is magnetic RAM memory. We've already heard this here from the discovery, not the discovery, but the rediscovery, let's say in 1995 to the first uh, commercial uh, device uh, in 2006, it was only 11 years as well. This was done uh, with the uh, with, uh, worsted fields, right? Uh, kind of a magnetic ram. Now uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the technology, people are using STTM rams. They are these major, major companies like IBM, uh, Samsung, uh, even Intel uh, are, are announcing uh, these, um, this uh, STTM RAM mass production, so really is kicking kicking in in the in the, in the market. So so that's that's very successful, uh, very successful uh, story, right? Uh, technologically speaking. But uh, what I want to go is a bit uh, a bit different, a bit beyond. Is like okay, uh, can we do something a bit more? Um, uh, sophisticated in terms of uh, exploiting the spin transport of these materials uh, and thinking about a second generation of spintronics devices in which uh, you you want to uh, you want to take advantage of the of the fact that you can transfer this information of uh, you know in magnetic elements somewhere else so you know you could integrate magnetic memory and logic operation in the same device right a bit the motivation for all of this is the trend in electronics. Um, uh, everybody has heard about Moore's law. So this guy is Gordon Moore in 68. That, that year he uh, predicted the famous law that now has his name. It was basically a very simple uh, graph with only five points, right? From 59 to 65. He observed that in the newly, you know, uh, discovered or, or uh, invented integrated circuits, the number of transistors per um, per integrated circuit was doubling every every two years. So that's a log two. Okay, so basically every 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 number here is is doubling the the amount of uh, of uh, components. And he kind of uh, did a, an extrapolation, and he suggested that in the next 10 years, this could keep up, and it would be very, very nice for the industry. OK, now it's been more than 50 years. Gordon Moore is a bit older, but he's still alive. 
and his law it's still it's still valid right it's it's been like uh, for 50 years going on from like less than uh, here in the se in 1970 thousand transistors per integrated circuit now we are talking about 50,000 millions, 50 billions. So that's a, that's a success. But we, we should not only look at the number of transistors, you should, we have to look at other, other, other things that are very important. For instance, power. This was uh, mentioned by, by, by Jairo in his first talk that you know every time we, we search in Google, we spend as much energy as boiling you know, one liter of water or many liters. Uh, and that's because all the computers nowadays are not very efficient energetically, right? So this was already kind of foreseen a long time ago. In, in 2000, there was this prediction is like, okay, if we keep on as we do now, the power density that we will have in our integrated circuits will, will start increasing dramatically. And you know, in 10 years, that this was predicted in 2000. So say in 2010, we'll have the power density of a rocket nozzle, and we can go even to something like the sun surface. So that's that's unbearable. It, it, it's not it's not possible, right? And maybe maybe the ones who are older here and had uh, some desktops at that time could could see this by frying eggs in, in the in the microprocessor because it was heating up so much. I think it's still happening. A bit. So. We have to look at other 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 parameters here. Eh? Not only the not only the Moore's law, that's the transi transistor density, that's the the yellow curve. Um, actually, because of the heating problem already in 2005, that's 15 years ago, the frequency of the sim of the transistors was uh, not increased anymore. Before it could be increased because by doubling by decreasing the size of the transistor, the energy consumption was lower, and this was uh, compensated by by increasing the frequency, but at some point the the, the problems of uh, dissipation of heat dissipation was so much it could not be bearable. And in the last 15 years, the frequency it's been uh, stopped at five around five gigahertz. Okay, so somehow in order to compensate for this, that's where the introduction of more than one logical core was introduced uh, from one before 2005 to several. Okay. Uh, but still, uh, the efficiency is not the same as it used to be. And if you look at the at the at the performance, uh, you know there's a change of a slope here. Right? It's still uh, the, the performance is increasing over the years, but it's not as steep as the Moore's law itself. Okay, so and this is all related of, of energy efficiency. So there are many other parameters here that only make things smaller. Um, kind of this heating problem was already faced uh, by the semiconductor industry uh, before. Uh, before CMOS, there was a bipolar transistor, and it had this kind of a uh, very rapid increase in, in the heating. Right? It needed to be water cooled at the time, and when CMOS was introduced, uh, this uh, uh, problem uh, disappeared. And now, with the um, miniaturization, we are facing the same problem again. So, we would need to find a new technology that replaces CMOS, and hopefully, will bring it back to a very energy efficiency and, and, and no uh, heat dissipation or much less. Okay, so that's where spintronics maybe can be this post um, technology, hopefully. So in order to have a, a very naive uh, a view of, of why I, uh, we think spintronics or spin currents in particular can be, can be better, we can check at the definition of charge current and spin current. Okay, a charge current is basically the time derivative of a charge in a given position because the charge is a constant. In a, in, a, in, a, in a particle, in an electron, essentially, uh, the, char uh, the charge current is just a, a, a charge that it's moving uh, at certain speed. That implies dual heating. On the other hand, spin current, uh, you know, because a spin is not the conservative quantity, it can change, it can be plus one half or minus one half in the case of electrons. Uh, when you do this derivative, you have two different terms. One is at a constant spin that it's moving speed. So that it's like a spin polarized current. We'll see this soon, but this will not help you uh, with respect to charge current. But you have another component, which may be that the electron does not move. It's in the given position and it only flips the spin. Okay. This could be the concept of spin dynamics. The spin is uh, the spin information is propagating, but the charges aren't moving. So 
the heat dissipation is, is strongly reduced, right? So there is some, some interest on, 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 on this. So just uh, to make clear the different concepts I will use in, in the talk, let me define uh, the different type of currents, okay? Uh, the charge current can be defined as the current with electrons of spin up and spins down, and the spin current will be the difference of the current with a spin up and spin down, okay? In a normal material, the normal conductor, when you pass current, you have half of the spins up and half down, okay? So the net spin current is zero. You have a charge current and that's it. If you pass current through a ferromagnetic material, then, and we will see soon why, uh, you have more electrons with a spin in one direction than in the other. For simplicity, I will say spins up. So in this case, you have a net spin current and a net charge current, okay? And finally, you have another, another possibility. You can have a, you have a situation where uh, electrons with spin up move in one direction and electrons with spin down move exactly in the opposite direction. In this case, you have a pure spin current because the net charge current is zero and it's only a spin current that you have, okay? So we would be interested in working with this kind of uh, current. So the general idea would be, okay, how we can work with pure spin currents? We will need different ingredients. We need to generate this spin current. There are different ways to do this, okay? Electrical spin injection is the one that I will uh, discuss later, but there are other ways, spin pumping, spin hall effect. I will just mention them. Once this spin current is created, we want to transport it as far as possible in a non-magnetic material. Okay, so we need to uh, start the spin transport and optimize it. During this transport, you would like, you know, for kind of uh, different operations to manipulate it. You can do this with electric field, magnetic field, etc. And finally, you have to uh, detect the outcome of this manipulation by detecting the spin. And typically, the effect that you use for uh, injecting or generating, you always usually have the inverse effect that can be used to detect. How we can generate this pure spin current? There are different, different ways, okay? One is the electrical spin injection. Here, the source of the spin is a ferromagnetic material. You pass current from a ferromagnetic material to a non-magnetic material, okay? That's the topic of this lecture. But there are other ways that I will just mention there is the concept of spin pumping. In this case, the source of the, of the spins are again, a ferromagnetic material, but here you induce ferromagnetic resonance. So you shine microwaves, typically in the gigahertz range and uh, the magnetization processes. Uh, in this regard, basically you are pumping uh, a magnons to the interface with a non-magnetic material and you create a, a pure spin current that flows away from this. Okay, this is going to be probably the topic of uh, some of the speakers in the session of monetization dynamics uh, uh, in today's. Another way to create pure spin current is with the spin hole effect. Uh, in this case, is the only case or one of the few cases where you don't need a magnetic material as a spin source. The source here is the spin orbit coupling. And when you pass a charge current, you create a transfer spin current. Okay, so this is going to be the main topic of, of uh, the talk of Sergio Valenzuela in, on May 21st. And another way to uh, generate pure spin currents is again using a ferromagnet as the spin source. And uh, unlike the case of uh, spin pumping, you can create a temperature gradient, which also um, generates magnets and drives magnets. And at an interface with a non magnetic material, due to exchange interaction at the interface, you will create pure spin currents at the other side. This is going to be the, the talk of Miriam Aguirre on May 26 on spin color electronics. Okay. So let's go for the first uh, ingredient, spin injection. Okay. So first of all, we need to understand how is the electron transport in ferromagnetic materials. Uh, Jose Mari uh, before me already, already uh, discussed a, a bit about this, but I will do it again. Uh, so maybe finally we'll understand it somehow. <laughs> so we need to introduce the two-channel model that was introduced by, by Mott in 36, and then it was successfully used uh, by uh, Ballet and Fert to explain GMR uh, in the beginning of the 90s. The basic ideas that you need to have is, is, is two. One is that in a magnetic material, due to exchange interaction, you have a ex 
change splitting of the spin up and spin down subbands. Okay, there is a shift in energy. And because of this, the, uh, at, at, the, at the Fermi energy, the density of a state is different for one case and the other, right? Another thing to have into account is that we assume that the spin flip scattering is negligible. So the electron moving in the ferromagnet uh, scatters many times before the spin is lost. That was mentioned by Jose Mari. So the spin division length has to be larger than the mean free path. And uh, essentially, the conductivity is given by uh, different parameters that depend on the, on, the, on the properties of the Fermi energy right, of these electrons. So the spin conductance, the, the, the conductivity in, in particular depends on the density of states, the diffusivity, which may depend on the effective mass, Fermi velocity. So all these parameters will be different for spins up and spins down. Okay? This is just a, a, diagram, a diagram. But in the real in the real density of a state of magnetic materials, iron, cobalt, nickel, that's what you actually have. So with these concepts, essentially, uh, it means that if you have some of the carriers that have more uh, conductivity than the others, you have this two-channel model, and most of the current will be will be will be transported by one of the two channels, the one with higher conductivity. Okay. Uh, you can define the spin polarization of this current by this definition, conductivity for spins up minus conductivity for spins down divided by the total conductivity. Okay, so once we understand that when you pass current through a magnet, this current is spin polarized and it carries more electrons with spin in one direction and in the other, we can think what happens if we now inject current from a ferromagnet to a normal metal where you know the the uh, the, the the two subbands for uh, spins up and down is is identical. When you do this, uh, what will happen is that you will uh, inject more of the spins up than down of one type than the other. To simplify, I say up or down, but this will depend on how you magnetize. So what will happen is that you will accumulate more spins of this type than on the other. So there will be a spin accumulation and the chemical potential for spins up and down will be split. This difference between spins up and spins down, this difference in the chemical potential is what I will call spin accumulation. Okay. This is a non-equilibrium situation. This happens as long as you are injecting a current in the system. When you stop injecting the current, your normal metal becomes as it was before. Okay. So that's a non-equilibrium situation. Because it's a non-equilibrium situation, and this chemical potential, you can uh, you can see what will happen to this accumulation, to these uh, extra spins, by uh, uh, having a, a, a diffusion by applying the diffusion equation. So that's a very simple equation, and from here you can see how these uh, uh, accumulated spins will evolve. They basically will diffuse away for the no from the from the intersection area where you are injecting them you can uh, have the general solution of a diffusion equation, which is with all these exponentials, with all these uh, constants, and you have to solve it for each system. Okay, uh, The boundary conditions will tell you uh, what values are these constants. If you have a transparent interface or a tunnel barrier, this will be different. So as a very uh, simple example, in the case of a transparent interface, you pass current from the ferromagnet to the normal metal. You have two boundary conditions. You have a continuity of the chemical potential for spins up and down on the interface, and you have the conservation of the spin up and spin down currents. Okay, so with this, you can solve it, let's say, in one in one dimension, like the simplest case. And what you can get is the profile of this chemical potential. So that's the chemical potential for spins up and the chemical potential for spins down. Okay. You see this spin splitting, huh? the chemical potential opens up. But if you extrapolate for infinity, you also see that uh, you have an interface resistance that appears at the junction, which is the, related to the spin, it's spin coupled. Okay, and it has certain uh, a certain uh, magnitude that depends on the spin polarization of the ferromagnet, the different properties of each material. Okay, but that's an important an important result. If we now go to a, a bit more complicated device, we are going to construct now a spin valve, but in a lateral 
uh, structure. So this is a normal metal and two ferromagnetic electrodes, okay? And we will pass a current from the ferromagnet to the normal metal to the ferromagnet. This is like a, a, like a GMR spin valve, okay? But in a lateral structure. Here, if we solve the uh, spin diffusion equation, we'll see what the chemical potential for spins up and down does. You, you end up having two, uh, two, two interface resistances here uh, because of this imbalance of spins, which will be different if the two ferromagnets are parallel or they are anti-parallel, right? So the interface resistance in principle is a ferromagnet, let's say is, it has the same uh, polarization, the same uh, sign of the polarization, the interface resistance of the anti-parallel configuration is larger than the parallel configuration. So that's essentially the GMR effect, okay? But uh, measured in a, in a local geometry like this can give also some spurious effects. You are passing current through a ferromagnet, you have AMR and isotropic momentum resistance, you can pick up some Hall effects, so it's not, not the ideal geometry. What's interesting of using this lateral uh, spin valve is that you can do a non-local geometry and you can separate the spin polarized current from a pure spin current, okay? So if, if we pass the current from the ferromagnet into normal metal again, but we bring the current to the left, okay? Again, we have the splitting of the chemical potential. This slope here is because we are putting a, a bias. So the electrons tend to, you know, to flow in this direction. So that's why there is a net slope. But on the right side, you have this, uh, this decay, right, which is exponentials from the diffusion equation that basically, you know, the amount of the elect spin electrons spin up decay in this direction. So the ones of spin down move in the opposite direction. So this is actually a pure, a pure spin current. Okay, so on the right side, you have a pure spin current. You will decouple charge current from spin current. So we can put the second ferromagnetic electrode now at some place where the spin accumulation still is, is split not too far away. And uh, the second ferromagnetic uh, electrode will, will sense this because the voltage that I mentioned, this resistance will be, will be created, okay? And this resistance, uh, this, uh, this step here will be measured directly by putting a, bolt, a, bolt, uh, a voltage uh, probe there. This voltage will be positive if it's, it's parallel and will be negative if it's anti-parallel, okay? So here we will be measuring a voltage that is not related at all to a charge current passing through this, uh, through this circuit. Eh? The current goes on this other circuit. So the only reason we are measuring a voltage is because there is a spin current flowing. So we are detecting, we will be detecting only spin current, okay? Uh, uh, as, as, a, as, a, as a practical example of how it's done, here is a real device with two ferromagnets and a normal metal here. Again, we put charge current here. So we are injecting spins at the interface. It will diffuse in both directions. So away from the current, we'll have a pure spin current diffusing. This will be equivalent to the chemical potential for spins up decaying. And this will generate uh, a voltage here, okay? So typically instead of measuring, a, a, a plotting a voltage, we will plot the voltage normalized to this current. It's a non-local resistance. And this voltage will be positive or negative if you have a parallel or anti-parallel configuration. You can change this by applying an external magnetic field right, in the easy axis of these ferromagnetic electrodes. So what we will measure is something like this. We will measure a positive voltage, positive non-local resistance. It will switch to negative and it will switch back to positive. And then you have some hysteresis, okay? So this, this signal, this amplitude, hmm, is what I will call the spin signal, the pure spin signal. It's only because you are generating a pure spin current that it's flowing in your normal metal here. Okay. So now with this, we can we can we can study the different properties of this pure spin current. An important point here is that in order to detect this pure spin current, the distance uh, between injector and detector has to be of the order of the spin diffusion length. Otherwise, the spin is lost, and this typically is of the order of in the best materials, hundreds of nanometers. So, so you have to really put them really very close. Right? You need nano, nano fabrication to achieve this. That's different from the vertical stacks of GMR where the relevant distance is the thickness of the layers and this can be really thin, right? So 
if for this non-local uh, configuration we solve the spin diffusion equation, I, I don't want to go too much into into equations. Just you know, for you to have it to have it somewhere, right? You can recover the the talk later. The general case gives this uh, kind of complex uh, value uh, of the spin signal. There are two, two important uh, concepts here. There are all these R's, which are spin resistances, and I will explain later uh, what they mean. And also uh, different spin polarizations. Okay, we have the spin polarization alpha f of the ferromagnet that you are injecting. But in a general case where the interface resistance is high, is tunneling like, then you will have the spin polarization of the interface uh, that uh, Jose Mar explained very well that you can have in an ideal case of tunneling the Julliard's model, which could be the density of a state for spin up and spin down or in a more complex way, the, including the spin filtering effects, this would be effectively the conductance for spins up and spins down through this interface. And these two numbers, these two parameters can be very different. They have not to be the same. But this is a very general case, but we can uh, play with uh, numbers and go to the two, two, uh, the two extreme cases. One would be if you have a, an ideal tunnel junction at your interface, then the expression gets very simple. It's just a simple exponential decay, okay? As we can see here, so that's the spin signal. It's a, a log scale, so it, it decays exponentially. It's a line here. In the case of transparent effect, it's a bit more complicated. And the decay is faster in short distances, and then it becomes uh, also uh, exponential. So the you know the the problem here is that when the spins are injected at the interface, not all the spins flow into the normal material. Some of them flows back into the ferromagnet, and then some of the signal is is, is lost. So that's that's this difference. Okay, promise that I would talk about these uh, spin resistances. So that's a very uh, important concept uh, for uh, building spintronic devices. Essentially, it's the resistivity of the material times its spin diffusion length. And it's a measure of the difficulty for spin mixing. So uh, materials with a small, uh, low spin resistance, they will, the spin current will tend to disappear before, to relax before. And because it's a non-equilibrium situation, uh, have a spin accumulation, a spin current, it will like to go to the lowest uh, spin resistance path. Okay. So uh, with this idea, you can even uh, work with uh, equivalent spin circuits and, and construct, you know, what happens if you put two materials in series or in parallel and build up some complex uh, lateral devices uh, by putting together uh, the different spin resistances, and then you can you can obtain these complicated uh, equations out of it. Okay, so what what I mentioned a bit, what's the role of the interface, right? If you have a tunnel barrier, it's better because the spin signal is larger. There is no spin backflow to the ferromagnet, uh, as opposed to the transparent contact. On the contrary, in the case of a tunnel barrier, uh, typically when you increase the bias you are injecting from different density of states in the in the in the ferromagnet and the polarization can decrease this was shown by Sergio Valenzuela some years ago you see how the polarization strongly decays and it can it can be strongly reduced in addition if the bias is too is too high you can break the tunnel barriers which are usually delicate in, in, in on the contrary uh, in the transparent contact you can put a lot of current without breaking and because essentially it's all transparent, you are basically always injecting from the Fermi energy, the polarization will not change, will be kind of constant. Okay, this small variation actually is due to heating effects with the temperature and not the spin polarization. So this type of devices, uh, as an example here, they are fabricated with a nanofabrication. Um, you need different steps, you know, you can fabricate your ferromagnet first. Then do a second lithography step. If you want to work with transparent contacts, for instance, they have to be very clean. So you have to do a milling process at the interface before you, de you deposit the second, the second material. Uh, so just for you to have a flavor of how these kind of nano structures can be fabricated. But now, uh, okay, we go back to the to the measurement. We have the spin signal, and we want to get you know information out of it. Uh, how is the spin injection? How is the spin transport? How we can do this? If we look back at the equation, that's the equation for the transparent case, there are two relevant parameters here. One is the uh, spin polarization. We want to, 
we would like to know this. And the other one is the spin diffusion length of the normal metal, okay? Uh, in a single measurement, you cannot extract this information, but there is a, another parameter that you can change. It's the distance between injector and detector, okay? So we, you can fabricate uh, devices in which the distance is changed. You have different distances with injector and detector, right? And then you measure each one of them and you plot the spin signal uh, like, like this, and uh, you get the information from here as a function of the distance. And you fit this, uh, this variation with this equation. And from there, you, you extract these parameters. In this example, the ferromagnet is permalloy. It has 40% spin polarization. And the spin diffusion length of copper, which is the material here, is around one micron. So uh, I mentioned before that from here, okay, in the transparent case, we will get the spin polarization. In the tunnel barrier case, you will get the, the spin polarization of the, of the barrier. So in, in general, in the literature, there is a, a large dispersion because it strongly depends on the quality of the interface. Right? In the case of tunneling, here I'm putting some numbers for you to, to know. There's variation from like less than, you know, from 5% to almost uh, 50%, again, because the quality is very important. Or in the case of, of transparent uh, case, for instance, uh, a permalloy and co cobalt is very, very, very different values. Uh, permalloy typically gets a better spin polarization than cobalt. And some materials like cobalt iron seems to give even a better injection. Uh, so here is a bit of a summary of different results for you to see how we can extract uh, relevant information. Uh, from these measurements. So now we can uh, move to the next ingredient we are interested in, the spin transport, okay? Spin transport uh, information can be obtained from this kind of measurements. Also, we get the spin diffusion length here, right? The question is, what is the mechanism? What are the spin relaxation mechanism in conduction electrons that leads to the loss of spin? Okay, there are two main mechanisms. One is the Elliot effect mechanism. So when a conduction electron uh, moves, it scatters, and every at each momentum scattering, it has certain probability to flip the spin. Okay. So here it flips, then it scatters without flipping, and then it flips again, and it has certain probability, a probability A. So uh, at each scattering, uh, there is spin orbit interaction in the materials, and uh, that's the origin of the of the of the of the flipping. So the spin orbit interaction, the spin orbit coupling, can give rise to this flipping, and depending on the material, this probability will be stronger or or weaker. Another mechanism, another relevant mechanism, is the Akonov parel mechanism. This happens only in actually in in materials without inversion symmetry, so non-symmetric crystals. And that's because in this case, the spin subbands are no longer degenerate, right? In the same momentum state, they have spin ups and spin down have different energy. So that's equivalent to have an internal magnetic field. And the spin, well, uh, the, the electron spin, when moving from one scattering event to the other, it will process around this effective field. And uh, then that's where how the spin polarization is lost. But when you scatter, you kind of, uh, you reset the precession and then it acts against relaxation. So the more scattering you have, the less chances the, the, the spin has to process. So the spin is not lost. Okay, in this case, then the momentum scattering time is inversely proportional to the spin flip time uh, as opposed to the Elliot effect mechanism. Okay, so for your information, that's a typical way of how to obtain momentum scattering times uh, from resistivities or uh, spin flip time that is related to the spin diffusion length uh, through the diffusion. For the case of LED effect, we have metals and semiconductors with inversion symmetry. And in the case of diakonov parel this happens in semiconductors without inversion symmetry, like gallium arsenide or uh, two-dimensional electron gases, quantum wells. So let's go to see some numbers. In the case of metals, here are some, some results on the spin diffusion length. The best metals so far are copper, silver, and aluminum with a spin diffusion length of around one micron. Gold is a bit uh, less, around 100 nanometers, because spin orbit coupling is stronger. But in all cases, the the, the spin relaxation in metals is due to Elliot effect. This is well, uh, that's well well confirmed. We can convert easily in case of metals the from the momentum relation to a better known parameter, which would be the spin diffusion length and the resistivity. So spin diffusion length is inversely proportional to the resistivity and that's been confirmed in many metals so far. Here are some examples from this. Uh, it's getting a bit old, but um, in this review. 
in the case of semiconductors, um, there's a large variety of, uh, of uh, spin diffusion lengths. The best one is in the case of uh, undoped silicon, 38 microns. When you dope silicon, then you have more impurities, more scattering, and then it decreases. Or in case of germanium, which the spin orbit coupling is stronger, also the spin diffusion length decreases. Um, but it, it goes around, yeah, few, can be up to few microns, okay? In this case, the origin of the spin relaxation may be very different. As I mentioned, in the case of silicon or germanium that have uh, a very uh, uh, structure with inversion symmetry is Elliot Diaffet mechanism. But in the case of the gallium arsenide or indium arsenide quantum wells, it's been shown that it's a uh, diagon of Perel. Another interesting material to discuss here, it's not a semiconductor or a metal, it's, it's, it's a semi-metal, it's graphene, okay? This material caught the interest, caught the interest of the uh, Spintronics community because uh, there was a prediction of a very long spin diffusion length. And that's because it's composed only of carbon, which has a very low spin orbit coupling. Okay, when, when the first experiment in 2007, it was uh, done, the, the number was not as, as exciting as expected. It was around one to two microns. And at that time, there were a lot of effort trying to improve this value, right? Because that was supposed to do. Uh, it was supposed to, uh, it was unclear where the, the scattering, uh, the spin relaxation was happening in, in graphene. So there were different attempts, for instance, doing suspended graphene, because it was thought that the, uh, there were, uh, uh, the, the surface was trapping you know, impurities and that may be the, the, the origin. And this starts to increase when uh, people are starting putting graphene together with boron nitride. Uh, so boron nitride with uh, graphene basically removed a lot of the impurities, especially water, and the signal increased a lot here. And then by fully encapsulating the graphene, also you are basically flattening out the graphene. So all these typical ripples that you have in graphene, which are also a source of spin orbit coupling, also were removed. And then the spin division length could be reach to a record of up to 30 microns that it's getting closer to the theoretical expectation. So, so far graphene is the most, um, uh, I mean, the best spin transporter so far. A different issue is the origin of the spin relaxation. It's still not well, well known. Uh, originally it was thought that in bilayer graphene, it was diacon of Perel and the monolayer graphene Elliot Diafet. This was like early results, but Soon later, it was seen that actually uh, both in bilayer and monolayer graphene, uh, the two effects were there, the two relaxation mechanisms, diacon of Perel and Elliot Diafet. And this is still not fully addressed and there is still even uh, some controversy and, and discussion, discussion going on. So th this kind of technique that I show, uh, this non-local measurement uh, is okay for measuring long spin diffusion length, but there are many metals with strong spin orbit coupling, which has a very short spin diffusion length. Uh, and it's also very important to quantify. And a way to do this is uh, uh, with a spin absorption measurement, which is basically a variation of the technique I showed. Mm -hmm. You can use a lateral spin valve with a very well-known um, properties, let's say permalloy copper, have some spin signal here. And now you can put in the middle of the bar, uh, the material you want to study, part of the spin current will be flown, will be flowing in the material. So the signal you will pick up, the amount of spin current will be lower. So but with this decay, with this decrease of the signal, you can again calculate it with a simple one dimensional equation. You put it there, you get some complicated formula. But essentially, this is the ratio between the two signals. And you can extract one parameter here, which is the spin resistance actually of the, of the middle wire. This middle wire and this spin resistance is proportional to the spin diffusion length. So you can get the spin diffusion length even if it's very short. OK, so typically, you cannot measure a device and then add metal there on top and measure it again. So essentially what you do is in the very same device, you do a reference spin valve and a one with the material in the middle. And then from here, you can extract spin diffusion length. Uh, this is an example with the gold and platinum, which values which are very small, you know, three to two nanometers values are extra extracted. In the case of gold, it's a bit uh, longer. So finally, we can go to the last uh, ingredient, which would be spin manipulation. 
the easiest way to manipulate spin is with a magnetic field. Okay, so let's go back to our lateral spin valve where we can create the pure spin current here in, in the middle. Okay, we are interested always in pure spin current because the, you don't have spurious effects that can mimic you know other magnetic resistant effects. So that's a clean measurement. That's why usually we stick to this for this type of measurements. And now what we do is we put a magnetic field out of plane here. The spin will process around this magnetic field. Okay, that's the this would be uh, given by the Larmor frequency, which will be proportional to the magnetic field, the frequency of rotation. So essentially what will happen is that spins, the spin current will, will change the polarization direction. Okay. And it will be uh, like perpendicular or even anti-parallel to the magnetization. So your voltage you will measure will be uh, oscillating. Okay. So you will, you will measure something like this. If it's parallel, if you start with the antiparallel configuration, then you have the opposite effect. Okay, that's the so-called Halle effect right? or Halle precession effect. Um, what you see is not only the precession; the precession would be, you know, like ideally a, like a cosine in there. On top of this, you have other effects. You you will have the diffusion effect and also a relaxation because it takes some time for the electrons to reach from one side to the other. Not only the precession, but you can have the overall effects and fit it to your to your uh, result, to your curve, and actually extract some of this information. You can actually extract the spin relaxation time again. So the spin diffusion length, in other words. So actually, this is a, a good idea because not always you can do a very systematic study where you change the distance and see the decay in order to extract the spin diffusion length. Maybe you know the device is complicated or you have, I don't know, a very complicated nanowire that you want to contact and just measure this very you know, complicated nanowire from a basic point of view. So you can take just one distance and do the and do the and do the Halle uh, precession and fit it. Okay. Uh, you see that depending on the distance, the oscillation will, will change. It's because it, the, the spin has more time to, to act under the magnetic field and to process. So you have see more oscillations at long distances at short. But you take this into account in the equation. And when you fit, you should get the same spin diffusion length, which is more or less what I'm trying to show in this example. OK. OK. External magnetic field is, is very nice, but for applications is, is um, it's not ideal. Ideally, you would always like to manipulate with uh, electric fields. Okay. And this was a, actually a very early idea in Spintronics community. Data and DAS already proposed this uh, now called Data DAS transistor, right? In which you put a, a, a spin current uh, from a source to a, I mean, from an injector to a detector in a two dimensional electron gas where you have rush by effects. So when you put a transverse electric field here, via a gate, you induce via spin orbit coupling an effective, um, an effective magnetic field. So the spins traveling through it will process similar to the Hall effect, but it will not be due to a real magnetic field, but it will be this uh, effective field, this internal field. But the amplitude of the internal field will change with the gate. So you will be able to modulate the spin polarization reaching the, the detector, okay? So this idea is very nice and it's been the, the driving force of many researches in spintronics in the last 20 years or almost yeah almost 30 years now more than 30 years actually uh, but it has a fundamental problem is that okay you, you need that the the material has spin orbit coupling for this uh, for this uh, you know induction of the Reichberg field but at the same time it's bad for spin transport i mentioned right spin orbit coupling and due to elliot diafet mechanism it kills the spin transport so that's a fundamental problem and that's why uh, practically it's uh, been very hard to realize okay we see show some examples later a different alternative is not to try to man manipulate the spin uh, polarization, but just the spin current itself to turn the spin current on and off, like a field effect transistor, but for spin currents. Okay. One idea here is that you can you can have a, a spin absorber, like in the spin absorption experiment I mentioned, but with a material that's semiconducting with large spin orbit coupling, so you can modulate the resistance and therefore the spin resistance. So you know, depending on the gate that you put, uh, the electric field you put, the, the spin current will flow through the channel or will be absorbed. So you turn it on and off. 
Okay, so here's a completely different concept and you try to play with electric fields. So practical realizations of this, in the case of data that's transistor, it's been achieved in some cases in indium arsenal based heterostructures, always at low temperatures because of this com complexity. These are voltages that are related to the spin accumulation, the spin current, uh, and are modulated with a gate right, in these examples. In the case of a spin field effect transistor idea, it's been realized in van der Waals heterostructures at room temperature, combining graphene with TMDs, transition metal decalcogenides, and you see here how the spin signal itself is turned on and off with a gate voltage. Okay. So one last uh, concept of uh, manipulation, maybe it's not strictly manipulation, uh, is the spin transfer torque. Okay, this actually will be the the main topic of uh, another uh, different talk of Andrew Kent, I guess, May 21st. But just a, a very simple idea here is that the same way that the ferromagnetic magnetization defines the orientation of a spin current when you pass it through, you will have the reciprocal effect, right? The spin current being injected into a ferromagnet will, uh, you know, will define the orientation of this ferromagnet because it will uh, induce a torque uh, via angular momentum conservation if it's large enough, right? So maybe we can use these pure spin currents to switch magnets, right? Uh, so there is a big topic here in spintronics, which I will not go because it's a different concept, but just I will just mention one experiment because they also use a non-local spin valves, lateral spin valves, and from these pure spin currents that are created here, they were able to switch the ferromagnetic detector. It was made very small, like a very small, tiny island to have not enough anisotropy, you know, very low anisotropy, so it could switch easily. But um, this was achieved. So, you know, in addition to see this non-local spin valve signal, like the spin signal effect, by passing a DC current, okay, if the current, the spin current was large enough, it could switch from anti-parallel to, anti to parallel configuration. So the detector was switched with pure spin currents. Okay, so this is possible. So with all these ingredients, maybe you can think about integrating these you know, magnetic elements as magnetic memory and spin currents to logic operations in devices. So that's one of the, of the motivations here. There's different proposals theoretically of, uh, that are based on spin with this idea. Probably the first one was this spin-based magnetologic by Derry and coworkers. So the idea is, again, you have a spin channel Okay, where the spin is transported and different ferromagnetic uh, elements where the information is stored, uh, ferromagnetic electrodes. So two of them carry the input information, two of them is the operation you want to perform, and the fifth one is used to read the information. So you inject uh, spin currents there and the currents diffuse and mix, and then depending on the configuration, you read a voltage output and you, you, know, you get the operation. Uh, and you can reconfigure this, uh, this you know, magnetologic gate by, by writing you know, the operation you want to do with a spin transfer torque, right? So you change it and now you do the operation again. Uh, there is another concept called old spin logic in which the idea is exactly the same. The only difference is that the, even the switching of the magnets for writing, it's also done with pure spin current. Here it was like a simple spin transfer torque so through charge current here. And there's been some experiments in which they did some very simple uh, uh, operations that lead to a logic operation. I think this is an XOR operation here. It was done with graphene as a spin channel and three ferromagnetic electrodes. And depending on the configuration, uh, they did a logic operation here. Okay. So with this, I will, uh, I will finish my talk. I hope I'm not too late. Thank you very much, Felix. Uh, okay, the, this is not Monza Rivas, as uh, as clearly you can you can hear. Mm, but uh, okay, she she should leave, so I I will be sharing the the questions. Thank you very much for for a very very nice talk, very interesting, and uh, it was just the, the kind of talk we were we were really asking you for. So. 
Mm. Okay, just uh, uh, allow me to say, uh, yeah, I'm still here. For <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> I told you you could count on me till the end, but it is true that I need to rush for uh, some. Oh, I'm course. sorry. So I just wanted to thank Felix very much for the for the very interesting talk. And you have there are a few questions that you may see. You have three questions in the chat. So um, after saying thank you very much to everyone and to you, Fernando, for making me share this event today. Oh, thank you to you. <laughs> please. Uh, I will say bye bye to everyone and uh, please enjoy the rest of the of, of today and uh, the rest of the workshop too. Bye bye. Thank you, Monse. Bye. bye. I think the first question for you is uh, from Ron Golfer. Uh, Felix, uh, can there be channels that have whole positive charge current instead of electron negative charge current? Would such holes have a spin? Uh, yes. So es essentially, I mean, any carrier that that transports uh, that 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 transports uh, charge uh, will have spin, and then e everything I mentioned as as electrons. It's also valid for for holes. I mean that. Uh, so uh, we, we should replace electron by carrier actually. Yeah. So in the same way that the hole is uh, moves with the charge in one direction because the electrons are doing their rearrangement, they they also do with the spin. Yes. So this, this idea of a collective movement, which is yeah. a hole, is uh, also works. So. Fernando, I think insulator against the direction of tunneling where the magnetic fields are parallel, does the resistance decrease further? Sorry, uh, uh, Fernando, I lost you for a moment. Can you okay. repeat, can you repeat the, the question? Okay, uh, it's, a, it's a quite a long question. In, in fact, it, uh, it has three sub questions. So let me, let me read again. For a tunneling magnetic resistance, resistant spin valve, if one applies an electric field in the magnetic insulator against the direction of tunneling when the magnetic fields are parallel, does the resistance decrease further? And if the electric field is suspended when the magnetic fields are parallel, would magnetic resistance increase? I hope you understood. <laughs> okay, I mean, uh, okay, first thing is, is uh, I mean, there are no magnetic insulators in these systems, so... Okay. Uh, just just to make clear so the these are all conductors so the 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 non-magnetic channel can be semiconductor uh metal or graphene it's conducting and the, and the ferromagnets are also conducting huh? you pass current and they are spin polarized so here here we are not talking about uh um insulators the only thing that is insulating is a, is the barrier right the tunneling barrier and the electron tunnels through so if i understand correctly the the question is is what happens if the instead of injecting from the ferromagnet to the normal metal you inject the opposite way from the normal metal to the ferromagnet is that that the question i think so okay i mean okay one has to think that okay the uh, the value high low in this non-local configuration does not apply because you don't have a baseline resistance that increases or decreases. You are picking up a non-local voltage that uh, it's it will be proportional to the current because you inject the spin current, but it will be proportional. So you will, when you have parallel, when you have parallel configuration, the voltage is positive. When you have anti-parallel configuration, the voltage is negative. Actually, if you normalize this to the current, it looks like a negative magnetic resist a negative resistance, which is not a real because it's non-local. It's just a negative voltage, right? But uh, the average is, is, is zero. So you cannot define the magnetic resistance high or low. If you if you invert the direction of the current, all, all, all the all the all the all the effects here are a linear response. So the the if you inject in the opposite direction instead of uh, you know injecting uh, uh, majority spins from the ferromagnet to the normal metal, you will be extracting spins from uh, minority spins from the normal metal to the ferromagnet. 
and then this will uh, this will basically propagate the opposite spins, so everything will be reversed. So at the end, you will measure the same. The voltage will be opposite, the current will be opposite, so you will divide okay. negative voltage by the current, and everything will be will be the same. You have to simply be careful on on this. But it's 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 like not a classical in the non-local configuration. It's not a magnetic resistance effect in the in the definition that we saw before. It's just a, it's non-local, so it, it, it's voltage. I mean, the, the advantage of this is, is that the signal is purely spin, so you, you, are, you are sure that you don't have artifacts here, that in local measurements you can get from AMR and others. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. There is another question by Victor Alexandre that tells you, thank you for the very clear talk. Mm. He, he says he did not get fully the spin resistance. In lateral spin valves, does it happen because of the interface, the spin resistance? Yeah. No, I mean, this is a convenient way to define. I mean, you can go like from a scratch and, 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 and solve the one dimensional, I mean, the, 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 the spin diffusion equation. And naturally, the resistivities of the materials and the speed diffusion lengths appear there, but you will see that they can be grouped, right? And effectively, you see that the spin resistance acts as a resistance, but for a spin current instead of the charge current. And this is an intrinsic property of each material. It's uh, essentially, okay, if you can recover then the, the equations there, uh, it's the resistivity of the material multiply by the spin diffusion length of the material. So if the material is very resistive, so the currents don't tend to go there, then the spin currents don't tend to go there either. Okay, but even if the resistivity is low, if the spin diffusion length is very long, it means that it takes a long time to relax. And if there is another path with a shorter spin diffusion length that can relax faster, that's where the spin currents will go to go because it's a non-equilibrium situation and they will prefer to relax. So uh, the, two, the two components, like the two parameters have equal role and that's a product. In addition, there are some other parameters which are typically uh, geometrical in the way the, the spin valves are defined, but they are areas and cross sections. But that, that, that the, the exact definition depends on the construction of your device. Of your device. But you okay. know, in first approximation, mm -hmm. uh, if you want to see if a material has a large spin, or, uh, spin resistance or low, is to know the resistivity and the spin diffusion length. Thank you. He makes another another technical question. I mean, about instrumentation. What, which instrumentation or technique do you use or is used to grow or prepare these systems you you are you have been showing? Okay, I mean, in the case of metals, you need, uh, you can do evaporation or sputtering, metallic evaporation or sputtering. Um, in, in the case of, uh, I mean, th this depends on the, on the channel typically you want to do. In the case of uh, ferromagnets, we always, in this case, it's always ferromagnetic metal. So you pass current and the current is spin polarized as a spin source, that's electrical spin injection. So it has to be metallic for sure. The spin channel where you want to inject if it's semiconductor, metallic, or graphene, let's say it's very different, right? For graphene, you can do use CVD graphene and pattern it. You can exfoliate the graphene. In the case of semiconductors, it's typically more, more complicated. If you want high quality semiconductor, then you have to pattern it. But typically, um, typically, if the material is very resistive itself, uh, the uh, let's say if the spin resistance of the spin channel is higher than your spin resistance of the ferromagnet, even if you try to inject the spin, more, uh, most of the spin current will flow back to the ferromagnet. So effectively you will not inject, okay? So, and, and, and typically uh, semiconductors have very high resistivity. So the overall spin resistance is high. So that's been a, it was a, a big problem for, for many years. And you need to really uh, have a tunnel barrier like to avoid this problem. So the only way to inject spins in a semiconductor is putting tunnel barriers. And making good tunnel barriers on top of semiconductors is not easy. So uh, people were engineering like with uh, local doping. Uh, so, so there is a lot of complexity. Uh, so people have to be really an expert on, on semiconductors to grow these kind of devices. So depend on material to material. 
the one the examples I gave here, the simple signals were metals. So this was by uh, high vacuum evaporation, simply. But depending on the material, can be more complicated. Yeah, of course. Mm, yeah. Thank you very much. And uh, finally, we have a question by uh, Jose Fernandez Roldan, uh, which asks some. Uh, it's, a, it's a quite uh, maybe interesting question. Are short spin diffusion lengths interesting for any application? <laughs> so, do you want some time that the spin does not uh, does not <laughs> propagate far. Yeah. far away? Which, <laughs> Okay, uh, it's a good question. Yeah, so it's like why why I'm saying this, right? Okay, um, actually it's because the lecture is, is not complete, and we'll see later how important things may be. Uh, okay, for for the for the motivation I gave of you know transporting the spin far away, obviously it's not uh, it's not um, interesting, right? But what happens is that in other interesting applications, for instance, the spin hole effects, spin hole effects, in where you charge current is converted into a transfer spin current. These are materials with strong spin orbit coupling. And these materials have short spin diffusion length. And when you quantify these effects, when you do the experiments to extract the spin hole angle effect, for instance, you also need to know if you want to quantify properly these um, parameters, you also need to know the spin diffusion length because it plays a role. Basically, you know, even uh, wh while the spin current flows into this material, it's converted into charge, and you 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 need to know for how far this goes. So it's a very important parameter for a proper quantification, and typically it's been a source of problems. The uh, you know if there is a variation, you, you don't know really what's the spin diffusion length of your material, and you put any random number in the literature, you can make a big error then in estimating these other parameters like the spin hole angle. So knowing properly the spin diffusion length of this short system is also important for uh, for these other applications. And for materials with strong spin orbit coupling, you need to know, but the application is different. It's not for long distance spin transport. So thank you very much. Uh, I think there is no more questions in the, in the chat. Yeah. Um, I, okay, so I think uh, that is uh, all, and we are not that late, so we can be we can be finishing now this talk. Thank you very much again, Felix and uh, Jose Mari and Jairo for this uh, very three uh, these three very nice talks. Uh, thank you very much for doing the effort to be uh, basic and uh, didactic and uh, didactic and, and really as clear as uh, the, the, the subject uh, uh, asks, which is uh, quite a lot. But uh, okay, as, as Jose Mari told the, in the beginning, there are some bad news. This is not, not simple, not, not easy, eh, Jose Mari? Okay, so you, you, you were fully right. Mm, then let me, however, let me try to do something I was not able to do at the beginning of the afternoon. And I still don't know very much why, but uh, uh, maybe now I now it can, works. Maybe I can share the screen. Do you see my screen? Yes. Do you see only one screen, not two? Or, or you, yes, do you one? Yes. One. Okay, then. Okay, I, I wanted to, to share with the people that maybe is over there still looking. This is the place where I, where I mentioned that we would like to be having this meeting instead of uh, Zoom. Okay, that's, that's is, what we are missing. That's what you this mean. is, Janice. This is what we are missing. And this is what we are, in part, at least, winning. Okay, this, in fact, there are about uh, 130 of the registered participants are coming from from other European countries and Asia and South America mostly, but also North America and African. And we are, okay, very happy about that. And only I, I want to finish to show this, that is uh, to thank you all, all of you, of the, the three speakers today and the rest of the speakers of the lecturers that will be 
uh, given the lectures of the of the school. Thank you very much because of course of course you are doing the the most of the effort. Well, the, probably the students do some also. Uh, so see you all next uh, Wednesday at uh, three in the afternoon uh, Central European time. And I think we are done for the session. Thank you very much.